Welcome to Founder Stories here at 1871 Chicago's Digital Startup Hub, where we hear the greatest founders, great stories about how they built incredible uh, companies. We have a special guest tonight, a Chicagoan who's uh, living in Indianapolis, Indianapolis now, Scott Dorsey, the founder of Exact Target, uh, which he sold to Salesforce for two and a half billion dollars, and a great story in building that. Welcome, Scott. Thank you, Pat. Happy to be here. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. So this is an exciting one because. Um, you know, so many stories, um, you hear about multi-billion dollar outcomes in the Valley, um, you don't hear about them as nearly as much here and even less in other Midwestern cities. So uh, this is a great one. But for people who don't know Exact Target, we've been a customer, but for people who don't know it, how would you best describe what Exact Target does? Sure, you know, Exact Target started as a permission-based email marketing software platform and over the course of many years, you know, evolved into a full digital marketing platform, powering email, mobile, social campaigns for small businesses all the way up to many of the biggest enterprises in the world. And uh, how, how early was it relative to that, that type of your competitor base? Like where, 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 where did you start relative to them and you know, how, how, what, how how the competitive landscape uh, look like? So for people who would see the competitors today. Sure, we started Exact Target in early 2001 and our timing was really fortunate. We caught the wave of software as a service and really caught the wave of digital marketing. So we were early, but not too early, which is so important. And I know many of you entrepreneurs, you know, think about timing. I think you want to be out on the early edge where you're kind of evangelizing a new category of software, but you don't, don't want to be too early. And I think we were in a nice position in that we had earlier incumbents that were really serving very large enterprises, but the market for small and medium-sized businesses was really wide open. And it was the, the internet was really just coming of age and organizations and marketers were looking for new ways to leverage the internet to connect with their customers. Well, it's a great, it's a great story. I'm, I'm excited to go into it in depth. I enjoyed talking about it before. But before we, we'll take us back to the beginning. So, you know, where did you grow up? Where, where are you from? I know we claim you in Naperville here, but I- Sure, I sure. I'm, I'm super happy to be claimed as a Chicago native. I, I view that as a real plus. Uh, my father worked for IBM, so we were on the move every two years plan, but kind of anchored into Naperville. So I went to junior high and high school in Naperville, went to Naperville Central High School, and uh, you know, really, really grew up, you know, grew up in the Chicago area. And as, as Kevin mentioned later, went to Kellogg, lived in Hinsdale for four years prior to moving to Indianapolis to start Exact Target. So my roots in Chicago are really quite deep. And uh, talk a little bit about, you know, if someone knew you as a kid in Naperville or, or before then, um, what, what would they have said you were like? What, what, what traits you know, of you as a kid would people recognize of you as an entrepreneur? Probably unexpected that I'd be running a technology company. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I, I'm your kind of classic non-technical founder, but I was hardworking, you know, entrepreneurial, uh, very sports-minded, and so, so took, break, took break to leadership so did, opportunities did you ever, from uh, an early age. Were you, a, were you the kind of person who, um, found his own entrepreneurial opportunities to make a buck here or there doing things? For sure, for sure. Probably so, like many kids, I would you know, shovel any driveway I could. And here, fortunately in Chicago, we had a big supply of those. <laughs> Dating myself a little bit, but I lived <laughs> here during the uh, big uh, kind of late 70s, early 80s snowstorms, which were right in my sweet spot of earning years as a young, as a young boy. And mowed lawns, you know, did whatever I could to, to earn a few extra dollars. And then loved sports. And, uh, and it still loves sports, actually. So I think a lot of my competitiveness and, and leadership skills were perhaps kind of honed at an early age through basketball, baseball, golf, and tennis. That's great. And in high school, what did you focus on? How'd you like spending your time? Where would, where would we have seen you in Naperville Central? Naperville Central, Central. yeah. Naperville Central. Lar you? Largely sports. I, I, I played uh, basketball, sports? golf, and tennis. Nice. And uh, was captain of a couple of those sports and, and very, very competitive. I dabbled in some student leadership opportunities, but pursued those much more fully when I went to Indiana University and hopped into, into college life. Got it, so you, you go to college, and um, why Indiana? It's a great school, but what, it's auspicious, obviously, because you've now become a Hoosier, but what, what was it about IU that, that drew you there? Yeah, you know, I'm a Midwestern guy, loved the Big Ten Conference, and, and really knew I wanted to study business, so I kind of narrowed the field to Big Ten schools that had an, had an awesome business school and fell in love with Bloomington. For any of you that have been to Bloomington, it's absolutely a gorgeous campus. It's kind of picturesque and, and storybook and has a feel for what college life should be like. So I fell in love with it and, and decided to jump in and go to IU and, and never regretted it. 
You could definitely uh, film any movie there and it'd be the quintessential. Yes, college absolutely. Movie, that's for and sure. Breaking Way actually has a fair amount of footage right? on campus. Yes. Classic, exactly. classic movie. Exactly. Now we're dating ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So you um, so you're at IU and how'd you spend your time there? I mean, people at IU, would they have seen things that made them think, well, this is a enterprising enterprising guy or Hopefully so. Hopefully so. I was a good student, hardworking. But I, the, I, so I, the joke is, people would have said I would have been an entrepreneur because I was the beer guy on campus for all the campus events, which is sort of a backhanded compliment. Right, right. I think you're yours that definitely may have been wasn't a me. More I was prestigious. I, I was the more responsible uh, exactly. type. Probably not as much fun. But that's why you're sitting there. And I'm sitting here. So yeah. I, my, I'll tell you, my goal, and hopefully my children will follow down a similar path, was just to soak up you know every ounce of opportunity that you know that college presented to you, and actually going out of state was a very big financial commitment for my family. So I felt an extra layer of pressure to get, as mo get the most I could out of right. uh, college experience. So certainly focused on, on academics, but really jumped into a number of amazing student organizations where I had a chance to uh, you know, kind of develop my leadership skills. So interfraternity council across all the fraternity systems. I ran Rush as a sophomore and then later got involved with the IU Student Foundation, which actually is the organization that puts on the little 500 that was featured in Breaking Away. So those were, those were great opportunities just oh, to make yeah. lifelong friends and, and, and get an opportunity to see what it was like to lead people and teams and, and organizations. Um, well, that's great. And the, uh, so you get out of IU, your degree is in marketing? Yes. Uh, and how do you decide what's next? How, do you, how did you think about that, and, and how did that unfold? You know, IU does an amazing job with a placement office, so I had lots of, lots of interviews, lots of opportunities. Ironically, the two that were most compelling were IBM, following in the footsteps of my dad, and then Steelcase. And it's kind of ironic that we're in the merchandise mart, actually, because I've spent a lot of many... Uh, many months and even years in the Merchandise Mart. So this is kind of my, my world's colliding of uh, contract furniture and architecture and interior design coming together with technology. But long story short, I went the steel case path instead of the technology path, wanting to kind of blaze my own trail, wanting to do my own thing, kind of break away a little bit from the path my dad had followed. And in particular, steel case gave me an opportunity to select from any of 20 cities around the country, and I chose Denver, and that's where I started my career. So st we talked about this before, um, and I think it's interesting because if people don't know Steelcase, and I've actually had some exposure to it, so I understand the innovative nature of it, but if you think of Steelcase, you don't think of technology, you don't necessarily, you may not be aware of all the innovation that has happened out of Steelcase over the years. But when we were talking before, you talked a lot about um, what an interesting, innovative place it was and, and what you learned. Maybe share a little bit of like, what was that experience like and how did they bring innovation to what to people in 1871 may feel like a more traditional industry, you know, the furniture industry out of Grand Rapids, Michigan? Yeah, you know, I think for, for any tech entrepreneur, you've got to leverage all of your work experiences and apply them to the new company that you're starting or that you're working in. And I was able to do that with Steelcase in a big, big way. And I'll just give you a couple examples. They're, they're, they're not obvious, and maybe that's why they're actually interesting. So at Steelcase, we focused on helping organizations build amazing spaces that drove teamwork, collaboration, and productivity. So early on, I always cared about space. And it's one of the reasons I love 1871 so much, is I think space is a magical way to bring people together. And in many ways, it's the physical representation of your brand and your culture. So creating amazing, inspiring spaces was always important to us at Exact Target. That came from Steelcase. Another couple examples, I was a part of this new college graduate program at Steelcase called PACE, which ironically stood for professional accelerated career entry, and it was an eight month long training program. So there was nothing accelerated about it, but we, we went to HQ in Grand Rapids, Michigan for eight months and worked in every department of the company for a week or two. Shipping, uh, customer service, finance, sales, uh, dealer relations, and you really learn every aspect of the business, and by the time they shoot you out to your field assignment, which for me was Denver, I knew the business actually far better than many of my older colleagues that had been with the company for a number of years. But the, the important takeaway was that building a new college training program, we could attract the best and brightest from college campuses became a really important ingredient to what we did at Exact Target. Oh, One of the real benefits of building a software company in Indiana is just access to all these amazing universities. You know, within two hours, we have Notre Dame, IU, Purdue, Ball State, Butler. So a key component of our strategy was to 
dominate campus recruiting and really build exact target into a very visible brand. So we created kind of a powerhouse internship program called Slingshot, new college graduate program called Catapult, and that became a key part of our recruiting strategy. Oh, interesting. So those were, those were two examples among many, actually. So how did, how did Steelcase keep an innovative culture in what was a pretty was a mature business at the time um, and, a, and a fairly mature industry? What was it about the culture there that um, you know, made that work? One of the, one of the, another kind of lesser known fact of Steelcase I think addressed is your question, Pat, is they actually acquired IDEO, um, or at least a large portion of IDEO, which is one of the largest and most innovative industrial design firms in the world. Right. Uh, David Kelly leading IDEO in a really meaningful way. So they were able to infuse a lot of that innovation and product design culture into the company through that relationship. So I actually learned a lot about design. I learned a lot about user experience. I learned a lot about brand. You know, all super important in the world of software as well. How interesting. Fascinating. Well, it's, uh, so, and then you got a great opportunity um, to uh, have a leadership opportunity in one of their businesses. Talk a little bit. It was called Metro? Yes, yes. So, Three or four years in, I had moved from Denver to uh, Phoenix, Arizona, to Southern California with Steelcase. Got tapped on the shoulder to run a sales team for one of their subsidiaries called Metro, which was a, a great opportunity at a young age for me to manage people and to kind of pursue that leadership path, which, which was very interesting to me. The company was also based in San Francisco, so it created real kind of connectivity for me heading up to the Bay Area. And I just, I fell in love with San Francisco, Silicon Valley. It's where I kind of got my first taste of technology and entrepreneurship. And then Metro was a 100-year-old company that was very small, actually only 15 million in revenue. And we grew it to 60 million over a period of three or four years. Wow. So we would often refer to ourselves as a 100-year-old startup. So I got the taste for what high growth felt like and what an entrepreneurial environment felt what, like. And what I were really the loved ingredients it. of it there? We were also very product driven, so we were reinventing product. We were out ahead of trends around how technology and workspaces were coming together. And it was just a really special company and a neat opportunity to be a part of it. Um, you've talked about culture being so important. What was it you took out of those cultures that with you into, into Exact Target? Passion. You know, I think in, in any company, but certainly smaller companies, you know, having that burning fire inside of you, just having amazing passion around what you're doing, loving the people you're working with. So much of my, I viewed my charter to exact target, especially during the later stages, was to create, I wanted to create a, a, an environment, I wanted to create a company that just remarkable people wanted to be a part of, and they could grow and learn and gain experience, and we all do it together. So those, uh, those learnings along the way were important, but I think a lot of them were around design, hard work, passion for what you're doing, and, and also building amazing teams. Got it. Um, talk, talk a little bit, if you would, you know, you made an interesting move um, uh, at a time when the internet was really cresting, the, for the internet 1.0. Um, you decided to go to business school. Why business school? Why then? And, and why Kellogg? Yeah, so having grown up in Chicago, you know, I always, you know, heard a lot about Kellogg, and, and it was a real aspiration of mine to go to Kellogg, and, and University of Chicago would have been amazing as well, but I felt like Kellogg was a very good fit with my values, my work style, and the areas in which I wanted to study, so I was fortunate I was able to convince the team at Metro that I could run sales from anywhere, and why not do it in Chicago, so moved my family back to Chicago, continued to run sales for Metro, but jumped into the TMP program, which was the evening weekend program at Kellogg, and went to business school from 96 to 99, which was this remarkable time to be in school just when internet you know, 1.0 was coming of age. Right, um, amazing. And then you can do anything when you leave. You've got lots of opportunities. Um, you chose an interesting one in a kind of famous, maybe somewhat notorious right. parent company, but it must have been a fascinating experience. You went to Divine in its heyday. What was that like, Divine Interventures, you know, in its heyday? It was wild. So I graduated in the, toward the end of 99 with uh, an emphasis on entrepreneurship and internet business models. So I was, I was ready to go. And, you know, half my classmates kind of quit their day jobs and moved out to the valley. And the other half of us quit our day jobs and, you know, hopped into, into Chicago Tech. And Chicago Tech at the time was, it was really all Divine. I mean, Flip had such a big vision and so, so much momentum that if, if you had a passion for Chicago Tech, Divine was scooping up a lot of talent. Ironically, the president of Divine was a guy named Scott Harkoff, who had worked in the Steelcase organization and was actually working on a tech startup in the contract furniture space, of all things. So I felt like it was the perfect intersection of Chicago Tech, 
leveraging my background and gave me a chance to jump into an early stage company. So I joined, I joined in early 2000, and I think I was about an employee 250 at Divine and one of the first employees in our little startup. And you know, the company quickly scaled to over 1,000 employees, and it was extraordinarily roller coaster, you know, kind of all the good and bad that come with it. What, but was, I, what was the good and what was the bad of something? Because this is really, in some ways, the, among the highest excesses of the bubble. Yeah, this was. I, this is kind of going back to the history books, I think, of yeah. the, the dot com boom. But I, you know, I stepped into Divine, and it took my breath away around just energy, passion, speed, the number of smart people that were all pouring in. I, I really, I'd never seen anything like it, and I, I became fascinated by how to raise venture capital, how to hire, how to build products, how to find early customers. So it was a chance to go from zero to sixty for me. With, with not having a technology background very, very quickly. The it's model- interesting, you're, you're always a student of the game in all these. It's an mm, interesting pattern, I love it. Mm, I, I, I like to learn and I think, especially when you jump into a new field, you really have to have a beginner's mind or a learning mindset. Yep. So, so Divine was that, it was this incredible learning experience where the company scaled up at an extraordinary pace, breathtaking pace, and then the dot-com bubble burst you know, in, a, in a dramatic way in spring of 2000. And Divine was really in a difficult position. They needed to raise more capital to keep growing, but the capital market's really drying up. And the company decided to push out an IPO in July of 2000. And I think it was actually the last IPO, the last tech IPO in the year 2000. And it was a super difficult environment. So I had always, I'd always imagined in my mind that an IPO would be a day of celebration, you know, champagne and, and balloons. And, exactly, and yeah. it was, that was definitely not the case. It was, it felt more like a kind of a sign of defeat or maybe a bit of a necessary evil because it was, it was a very difficult environment to push a young company out into the market. Interesting. So um, I, I want to quote some numbers here and then I want to go into exact target. But so 300,000, 3 million, 9 million. You recognize these numbers, yeah, I imagine. I think yes. So. These are your first three years in business, which for annual recurring revenue for a SaaS business are just mind blowing. Even today are mind blowing, let alone when the internet was less mature. So I'd love to take with that in mind, with everyone here knowing the incredible growth, you know, that you uh, as a company, Exact Target, achieved in those early years and, and beyond. But, you know, Often companies, Joe Mansueto talked about, they're, the, they're sort of this legendary two years that people take to kind of figure it out. You guys didn't have that two years. You took off like a rocket almost immediately. So we like to talk about founder market fit here, okay. um, which is the idea that the experience of the founding team is the right DNA both to build the business but also to find product market fit, right. that you have some kind of insight or understanding. So talk a little bit about the idea for Exact Target the group of you that founded it, and how that DNA and experience to sort of really hit the right, right product for the market at the right time uh, was a part of that. I'd be happy to. It's a fun story, and product market fit is a, a big passion area of mine back at Exact Target, and then now all the young companies that I work with. So This is as good a product market fit out of the blocks I've ever seen. We, we hit it early, which was, which was fortunate. So three, wow. three of us started Exact Target, Chris Baggett, me, and Peter McCormick. Chris is actually my brother-in-law, so there's some interesting dimensions to the founding story. We're married to sisters. We married into this amazing family from Indy, um, hence why we're all in Indianapolis now. What did, what, did the, what did your wives say when you said you wanted to do this together? Were they on board or a little nervous? 100% on board, uh, primarily because uh, my wife Erin was so thrilled to get back to Indianapolis to be around <laughs> her parents and her sisters, she trusted I'd figure it out. So fortunately, I had that going for me and gave us a little extra courage to sell the house, step down from design and divine and give this, give this new company a shot. But Chris is, is a consummate entrepreneur, has founded many new businesses that this are is, very compelling is, and very, is, very exciting. This is one of the more interesting and unusual founder market fit stories. Not that one of the members had experience, but how he got his experience. Because you're famous for selling to enterprises and you know mar companies that are more marketing driven. And explain to everybody what Chris's business was that gave him founder market fit for being on the bleeding edge of internet direct marketing. We're, we're a classic humble beginning story, Pat, and this, this story, almost a little hard to imagine when you, when you figure where we, where we ended up 10, 12 years later, but the founding story was Chris 
grew up with Ara Donnelly as a database marketer here in Chicago. So we, we both have Chicago, Chicago roots and connections. Chris was excellent at helping organizations leverage database marketing back in the print world. So it was all about understanding your customer, building data sets, and, build, and using that data to drive highly personalized communication. Happened to be more catalog and print back in the day. Chris wanted to try his hand at entrepreneurship, wanted to own his own small business where he could apply his database marketing expertise. So he bought a dry cleaner. He bought a five-store dry cleaner in Indianapolis and became probably the most tech-savvy dry cleaner in the nation. Uh, POS systems, barcoding, running database marketing programs, and quickly realized as a small business owner, his marketing options were very limited. Yellow pages, coupons, advertising in the newspaper, and there had to be a better way. So the idea was really born out of necessity what, that he... What year was this? This was, this was right around the same time I was at Kellogg and, and at Divine, so let's say kind of late 90s, early 2000. And he put sign-in sheets on the counter of his five dry cleaning school stores, basically sign up for my newsletter to learn more about clothing care and you know, the owner of the company and coupons and, and what's happening in the community. And people signed up in amazing numbers, actually. He had a database of two or 3,000 customers. He sent weekly communications. They loved it. They really felt more attached to the owner, his family. He'd show pictures of his kids. He would talk about what he was doing in the community. And it just became a powerful bond that was created. But Chris had to teach himself how to write HTML, how to run SQL queries. And he also comes from a non-technical background. So he came to me and said, there's just got to be a better way. I know that email marketing and internet marketing is going to transform marketing. And all organizations are going to leverage these channels. But we have to make it easier for the small business owner. And I, I felt like I was a prepared mind in going through the Kellogg experience and the Divine experience that I, I felt like I could identify a winning business model when it kind of hit me over the head. And, and Chris is so persuasive, he hit me over the head a few times to actually get me to do it. And uh, I, I've never regretted it. I, I jumped in and we agreed to build the company together. I actually said I'll only do it if I can be CEO. And he said, awesome, I hate managing people anyway. And uh, we, were, we were a match made in heaven. So he turned out to be the evangelist, thought leader, wrote a book, went on big speaking circuits, and I was really more the company builder. And then we brought a third partner on board, a guy named Peter McCormick, who I had worked with at Steelcase and Divine. Uh, did anybody at the dry cleaner ever make the connection between this $2.5 billion company and their former dry cleaner newsletter? I'm not sure they've made the connection. There might, may have been a few stories written that, that connect the dots. I was going to say, it's, what a great story. It's incredible. So that product market fit um, allowed you to really understand the small business market. We really did. So we, all three of us that started the company had marketing and sales backgrounds. We would refer to ourselves as marketers building products for marketers. And we, we had a very clear idea, actually, of what we wanted to build. The product was very simple, but it was tools to help you create emails, build a list, and manage your database, and then tracking the analytics. And we started with a simple product. Before the, word, the term MVP was in vogue, we basically built an MVP. We built a product that barely worked, but worked enough that we could go out and sell it. And then we really started selling to small businesses, small retail-based businesses, and then later moved up that, to franchise well, that organizations. That scratching your own, own itch thing is a, you know, incredibly successful. When I look at our product market fit series, the closer people are to scratching their own itch, the faster they get to product market fit. Now, sometimes products have a lot of surface area to get there or whatever, but it's, it's incredible. Um, that's such a common theme. And the next people who are closest to that are the people who were a consulting firm building it for a customer. Right, right. And then they built it enough of them, and they're like, well, we should do this for ourselves. Um, and they learned it. And so I, I just it, I give you such credit, but it's incredible the growth you get out of it. But obviously, selling is you know, never easy. Um, how did you, how did you, you know, how do you do the early entrepreneurial selling? What... How'd you decide who to target? How'd you learn how to get the pitch right? How'd you learn how to get the pricing right, the model right? How, how did talk about those early problem solving? Early on, a tremendous amount of founder selling. You know, we really we believed in what we were building, and all three of us had had significant sized networks. I would say of you know either people we went to college with or had had been out in the workforce with, and we we literally leveraged our network to the fullest. And we, we felt like we were building a product that almost any organization could take advantage of. So our network became very impactful. And we started with friends. You know, we really did. We sold to any friend or colleague you know, that would give us a few minutes. Uh, the three of us were very, very active in selling, which was wonderful, because the feedback loop 
back into the product was extraordinarily tight. We were selling, working with customers, and then feeding that right back to our product group, and we just kept evolving, iterating, you know, very, very quickly. We also took advantage of that point in time when most of our friends who were working for highflying.coms were now unemployed, and no exaggeration, we just hired as many as we could as independent sales agents. We, we couldn't pay them, we couldn't provide benefits, so we, we agreed to pay them a 25, literally 25% commission on anything they'd sell and give them stock options and said, come with us on the journey. And when we raised a little bit of angel capital, then we hired all of them, but we had an enormous sales team. We had a very large sales team early because of just taking advantage of kind of our friends and colleagues looking for their next, their next opportunity. So talk about how you make that work though, because you make it sound easy, but at the end of the day, a lot of companies I think I have a hard time going from founder selling to getting sort of professional or non-founder salespeople to be effective. How did you, how did you, how, how did you crack that nut? How did you make that work? Our, you know, our funding path, which we'll probably talk about, was a little bit of friends and family and then a little bit of angel. And we brought the little bit of angel on board. Our lead investor was a guy named Bob Compton who became chairman and a, a true mentor to me. And he always kind of forced me to hire three reps at a time to make sure that we were bringing classes of reps on board where we could train them, onboard them, enable them all at the same time so we gained efficiency. And then we'd learn by how effective they were selling into the marketplace. And he really didn't want us to get a false positive or negative that comes from one or two reps. So we would always hire kind of a class of three and we just kept bringing on and another is that three model, and another Do you three. recommend that model? I still do today. Now. I think it works. I think you have to be careful with only one or two reps so you can get a false positive or negative because really what you're trying to do in the early days is learn, see if you have product market fit, learn a lot about pricing and packaging and positioning in the market. It's funny, we have, uh, um, we brought on some three young people to sell in one of our businesses and there were two experienced people and this one guy was a sales development rep, young guy, super energetic and um, he, uh, he's, you know, he's hungry but raw, I mean like painfully raw in terms of his, um, and it was amazing. He brought the class in, everybody said who they're gonna make it, like he's, he's more of a appointment getter, we'll, we'll leave him there, we'll give him a chance. And uh, I've been out of the business a little while and I came back last uh, meet, board meeting and he beat all the experienced guys. Yeah, right. How about that? He's gonna sell about two and, two, two and, two, two and a half million dollars. And you know, it's just, you, if you didn't, if you tried to over engineer it to be like, well, I'm gonna identify up front who's right, gonna right. make it, you might not have picked him because he do. was so raw. But, Very hard to do. It's but he's exactly not just right. beating his class. He's not beating the guys that were the you know big guns who were brought in. And, and it's uh, uh, it's good advice because I think there is a tendency to um, you know be like, okay, we'll hire somebody, we'll train them. And I, I you know that that's a hard nut to crack for people. What are your other other thing? Real quick, yeah. we, three of us kept selling also, so we'd bring a sales team on board to sell more into the small business segment, and then three of us went kind of searching for bigger opportunities. Interesting. So we were actually competitive with one another also. We wanted to do better than each, each co-founder. So we had, a, we had a competitive dynamic among the three of us and then also with our sales team. And then, then obviously over time, you, you can't be selling and, and leading, so we shifted to more full-time sales leadership. But, but early on, it was every, everybody's job to sell. How, far, how long was it before you had a real VP of sales, hmm. non-founder? Three of us rotated VP of sales for quite a while, yeah. so it, it probably was three years. Yeah, um, and but, but all, part of that too was that was all of our background. We were right. we were all coming from a sales leadership background, so we felt if there was any area of the business we could run directly, that was that was our sweet spot. So talk talk a little bit about what based on those great experiences you had, and I want to get into moving into other areas, but just this early kind of getting the that early revenue that makes all the difference. Um, you could, once you can feed a lot more miles, it's, you can do a lot more as a company. Um, how did you, what, 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 when you talk to your companies today that you invest in, what are the two or three things that you sort of take away and say, you know, are kind of your advice that have been informed by this experience? If you're talking to a startup today, I've got an idea for a SaaS business, I've got a little product market fit, I'm doing some early founder selling, what, what's the, what are the go-to things, what's the wisdom you want me to be focused on? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So what I'm doing now is High Alpha, and we, we'll maybe talk more about that later, but High Alpha Studio is a startup studio where we start new software companies. Mm -hmm. High Alpha Capital is where we make investments in early stage SaaS companies. So we're seeing a lot of pattern recognition and getting experience across both sides of our business model. Mm -hmm. but, but early on, you know, our advice is to build design of the product first before you start writing code and do as much customer validation as possible. So we actually have one 
startup CEO now who had 75 customer conversations before we wrote a line of code. So, so we're big advocates of doing high fidelity design work in advance and really testing product market fit before you invest in engineering. And also trying to keep that MVP tight, you know, a compelling value proposition, but kind of tight boundaries on the functionality. You know, the smallest footprint in which you can deliver meaningful value, I think is, is really, really important. And then, we, and, then we, and then we try to get the product in the hands of as many customers as we can just to make sure that we're not trying to, we're not trying to dream what should be built in the product ourselves, but it's always customer informed. That, that customer intimacy is so important. And sometimes when you're slow to take off, you're slow to get customer adoption, maybe you're trying to hold the line on pricing, you can find yourself pretty far down the path where you're building a lot of features into the platform that aren't informed by the customer, and that can be a dangerous place to be. Well, I'll give you a great example. I met with a team yesterday who was, um, they've got an outsourced engineering team helping build the product, and um, these people come with a great resume, and they're smart people, but they got in this room and said, now just imagine, how would we want this to go? Forget about the customer, just imagine, just imagine, and I thought, I can imagine you're not gonna sell it to anybody. <laughs> right, right. If you don't start by saying, if you show up and say, all right, you're going to run your whole business differently because of this, it can be hard to plug in and get, get adoption. And it was interesting to me, I admire their open-mindedness, but when you're selling into businesses, you have to understand the context in which you're selling or you, know, you make adoption impossible or unappealing. Um, either of which is, you know, the same as being wrong. It's the beauty of the cloud and the beauty of these software as a service models is I, I think really your job is to inspire and lead the market, but listen. Yep. And if you really listen and can distill client feedback into common patterns, then you really have the roadmap of what you need to build. And I, I think that was one of our strengths at Exact Target. We were very, very good listeners, built amazing relationships with customers, and in many ways, they showed us the vision and the roadmap that we ultimately built. So I want to ask one question, and then I want to go into the scaling side of this. But um, you talked about, uh, you know, we always like to talk about our first customer. So how did you hunt down your first customer? Who were they, and how did you find them, and, and how did that? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, many of our first customers I mentioned were, were really kind of friends and colleagues, no question about that. But our first customer, I'd say, of significance, where we had no prior relationship, <coughs> strangely enough, was an Indianapolis-based company called Wild Birds Unlimited. And they were a franchise org of several hundred stores for bird hobbyists, bird, bird lovers. And we actually met them out at a trade show, the International Franchise Association. So we quickly learned that selling one small business at a time was heavy lifting. Right. So we started going after franchise orgs where we could get dozens or hundreds in one sale and what one was, transaction. What was the secret to getting franchise orgs instead of um, the single unit operators? Franchise orgs and Wild Birds Unlimited was a classic example. They were bringing their franchise system up on the web, building websites, but they wanted enterprise control. They wanted control over brand and images and copy, but they wanted some level of autonomy and authorship for the franchisee. And we actually learned and replicated that model, but did it in the world of email and digital marketing. And ironically, what we were building for franchise systems became highly applicable to <coughs> large selling organizations. So what we built for Wild Birds Unlimited was needed how'd you, for- how'd, how'd you pick up on that? How'd you learn that? Well, through just a lot of selling and a lot of customer interaction, we started working with organizations like Liberty Mutual Insurance that had thousands of insurance agents. They had the same set of needs. They needed well, so how, enterprise how'd you control. Get in? Most people would love to have Liberty Mutual. How'd yeah. you get in? We hired, rep, you in, hired rep in Boston, and he knocked on a lot of doors and did a lot of grassroots kind of guerrilla marketing and just kind of worked that local patch in Liberty Mutual and Boston Consulting Group became early customers. So we had that, we had that early kind of aha moment where we realized what we were building was highly applicable to any organization, really not just small retail retailers. And actually Boston Consulting Group and Liberty Mutual are two where we realized that this idea of um, enterprise control that allowed you to uh, lock down content, drive brand standards, but provide authorship <coughs> downstream, that that worked for Boston Consulting Group, it worked for Liberty Mutual, and worked for a lot of other large enterprises as well. Got it. Um, so. That moving up market, um, it's unusual to see companies that serve such a broad market from enterprise to small and medium-sized business. Um, you know, what, what do you think allowed you to, to make that move so, so easily? It, it, was, it was one of the, I think, unique differentiators of exact target or competitive set were either enterprise-oriented or small business-oriented, and our ability to span SMB to enterprise became 
a true differentiator. And it was very important to me to hold on to that vision because I felt it created the largest market opportunity for us if we could serve all segments. We also were students of Salesforce. Ironic that we ended up becoming Salesforce, but early on, we were a Salesforce customer and we tore every page out of their playbook that we could and they were the masters really of building a product that was remarkably easy to use and serve small teams but also could scale up to large enterprises. So we really replicated that vision in that direction and it worked for us in a big way. The, the obvious place it works is that it creates a larger market opportunity for you. So I'm an advocate of that. A um, couple of hidden benefits. One is it forces you to keep building a product that's remarkably easy to use. We had to serve the non-technical marketer and ease of use became paramount. Well, it turned out if you're a digital marketer sitting inside of Home Depot or General Mills or Expedia, ease of use is also really important to you as well. So it allows to flex up into the enterprise space. And maybe the last dimension that's a really Chicago relevant story is often small businesses become very large businesses. So one day I got a phone call from our inside sales team saying that uh, we closed a very small account over the phone, but they were starting to send more email volume and we thought they might have some enterprise opportunity and it turns out that was Groupon. <laughs> so true story, Groupon came in uh, through a phone call, inside sales team, very small transaction, early, early, just when Groupon was getting started. And then you know, later, Brad Keywell called me to introduce himself and said, I will be your largest customer. And I said, boy, that'd be fantastic. If that's the case, tell me more about Groupon. And we, you know, we had Microsoft and Expedia and Fidelity and Bank of America, and Groupon probably wasn't in our top 100. And Brad, uh, for any of you know that Brad, had a very big vision and a lot of confidence and conviction around that vision. And long story short, they became our biggest customer. <laughs> yeah, isn't that amazing? I, I found Brad's predictions to be remarkably <laughs> prescient. He was so spot on. I, I don't bet I was, against I was Brad. Glad I listened to him. I don't bet I against him. him. I may not always understand him when yes, he says yes, him, but yes. I, uh, I never bet against him. But what an him. amazing example of if we weren't serving the small business segment, we would have never found Groupon, they would have never found us, and they wouldn't have grown into such a, such a big success. Interesting. Fascinating. So talk for a minute. Um, about raising money, you bootstrapped. So you have this story of you bootstrapped and then you, have, you end at this two and a half billion dollar sale to Salesforce. But take us on that part of the journey. Obviously having grown such sales, you obviously were, um, what we see in a lot of successful Midwest um, SaaS startups is them being revenue first. Um, I think it's, it seems very hard. It's possible, but not nearly as easy as it is in the Valley to uh, run a high burn SaaS company here. Um, it's not that it's impossible, but if I look at the SaaS companies that have done well, almost all of them were revenue first and used revenue to, to drive cash flow. Um, talk about your story and when you decided to raise money, why you decided to raise money, and then the different steps because you had some, it was a bit of a roller coaster itself. Sure, sure. We, we, we had every stage of fundraising, friends and family, angel, venture, IPO. So when did you decide to, to, take, to take venture? Yeah, or can I even tell you the friends and family story? Please, I yeah. think that's kind of a fun one. So. Sure. Not only was it risky to start a company with a family member, Chris, my brother-in-law, but it's even riskier to raise money from family. But if I go back, if I go back to that time, we were three first-time software entrepreneurs, none of us with a technical background. The internet bubble had burst, and we we're starting a software company in Indianapolis. You know, good luck. It's no wonder you know every VC we called on said no. So we were we were out of choices, really. We were working without a salary, all three of us. We were selling but we needed some capital to get up and running. And we raised 200,000 in friends and family. And we also did a lot of barter for services. Our first development firm worked for equity. We had a marketing PR agency work for equity. That turned out pretty good for both those say. shops. Uh, but we were, we were terrified actually that we would lose our family's money. So we encouraged them to put as little in as possible. And we scooped up a lot of five and $10,000 checks from you know, my parents, my brother, my in-laws, a lot of Chris's neighbors. Probably, probably pretty hot, popular it, at the Thanksgiving and table. It, it, it worked out okay, <laughs> it worked out okay for everybody. So we started with the 200,000, and then later I'd mentioned gentleman Bob Compton that really led our angel around and, and really helped us, you know, formalize the company and kind of grow up and start scaling and learning from him. So we did, a, we raised about a million and a half in angel. And then our, our Series A was a firm out of New York called Insight Venture Partners, where we raised 10 and a half. But interestingly enough, only four of it came into the company as primary. Six and a half went back out to secondary for founder and early shareholder liquidity to 
give us some level of financial security so that we weren't tempted to sell the business too soon. And, and I look back on that as, um, I think, a, a really smart move for Insight, but also a move that worked incredibly well for us as a company because we were able, you know, after three or four years of bootstrapping, like really, really bootstrapping, and having young families and being very uh, scared about our financial future, we were able to take enough money off the table to give our families more comfort and more financial security, right. and then really reach for the stars and get aggressive and dream big, and that, that's what we did from that point forward. I think that's for the right people, it's a great, it's a great point and a very powerful one. I think my favorite one is that um, there's a company out in the West Northwest, Pacific Northwest you may have heard of, where the founder's parents put in, not quite their life savings, but their pretty active savings. Um, and uh, it worked out okay. It was Jeff Bezos' parents. So little known <laughs> nice. fact, nice. Jeff not Bezos' parents could end up on the Forbes list if they ever broke it out of Jeff's ownership. But yeah, it's, uh, not too shabby. It's good. He doesn't have to buy him a house, that's for sure. <laughs> I'm sure he takes care of them well, but he doesn't. they don't actually need it. It's, uh, so it's nice to see when those kind of great success Another happen. part of our funding story I'll share. So we, we went friends and family, angel, series A, and then we actually filed to go public in late 07. And... At that time, we'd only raised six million in venture, six million in primary, and we still had four and a half on the balance sheet. We were 48 million in gap revenue, heading to 72 million. And the market was very receptive to smaller, earlier stage SaaS companies going public. And we really felt as we were starting to shift to the enterprise, had big ambitions around international expansion, expanding beyond email into other forms of digital, that going public would give us the right platform to really carry that message and capitalize the business. Not all that different than when we started the company. Early 08, recession hits, stock market, IPO window completely closes, and we were actually stuck. We were not able to, we were not able to go public. And I, I've often described it as having all the, all the burden and expense of being a public company with none of the benefit. So hmm. we thought we'd just wait it out. I, the last thing I wanted to do was pull, pull an IPO. I viewed that as a real sign of defeat. It could be very damaging to our reputation and very damaging to employee morale. So we thought we're just going to stick it out. We, we're fine. We, we're, we're running cash flow neutral. We've got money in the bank. We'll just stick it out until the market gets better. And it just never got better. So we stayed on file Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. And little exact target for Minneapolis was not going to be the first software tech company to you know, break the IPO market back open again. It just wasn't going to happen. So at that time, late stage tech venture firms started calling and really convinced us that staying private, um, really doubling down on the business, like investing at a much think, faster clip than we had before was the right strategy. Been, what do you think the valuation would have been had you gone public? What's your ballpark sense? I, I think we had our eyes on probably about a half a billion dollar valuation, but I'm not sure I'm not sure we would have gotten that in the market. And then also we really would run the risk of not being able to invest in the business at the pace we ultimately did as a private company. Okay. What I did learn from being on file was that almost regardless of where you start from a margin perspective, Wall Street wants to see margin improvement, wants to see margin expansion. And we were, we were so bootstrapped and so capital efficient, we actually were profitable as a small SaaS company. And had we gone public, we would have had pressure to become more profitable, which would have completely eliminated our ability to invest in R&D, expanding sales, international, et cetera. It's one of the things I think people miss in the tech world is, you know, you, you, so much of what you do to grow is expense-based. And you can capitalize Absolutely. software for three years, but it's only three years. And uh, you know, I think people miss the fact that you know capex for a software company shows up on the expense line, not on the not on a long term depreciation line. And so it it makes it hard because you have to want to take losses. Now, of course, not every investor is savvy enough to recognize smart investment, high ROI investments from the other. But it's a tricky it's it, a tricky. It problem. is tricky. We had we had very strong unit economics. We had investors that knew how the math worked in a big, big way. We had one of our investors, a phenomenal guy, Rory O'Driscoll from Scale, had just invested in Omniture and helped Omniture go public and really understood, really understood the power of investing in R&D, but the power of building sales coverage and sales distribution and knowing mm -hmm. that you actually have to make that investment 18 to 24 months before you want the payoff. And, right. and that's ultimately what we did. So when all of our competitors were pulling back, cutting headcount, you know, kind of, you know, bundling in for the nuclear winter, we went the opposite direction and started hyper-investing in the business and built tremendous uh, kind of sales coverage in the United States and all around the world. 
And our, our bet, which turned out to work, work out just great, was that when the economy came roaring back, we'd be that much ahead of our competitive set. So we, we made those big investments in nine and 10. And then when the economy came back, we were in just perfect position for accelerating growth rates in 11 and 12. And then we went public in March of 2012 and had a super successful how, IPO. How was that experience? Yeah, that, it, was, it was incredible. I, I loved it. We, thank, thank heavens we didn't go public the first time. So second time around, we were a much larger organization, uh, wiser, more experienced. You know, we had already kind of gone through filing an S1 and working with Wall Street analysts. So we were uh, much savvier, I think, as it related to how to bring our research analysts and bankers together, how to write the S1, what an IPO was going to look like. But most importantly, the business was extraordinarily strong. So our growth rates went from, let's say, the low 30s to the low 40s to 55% growth rate um, in 2011, right as we went public. So we had these accelerating growth rates on a base of a couple hundred million in revenue, which is hard to do. Normally, it goes the other direction. Right. But it all happened because we kind of turbo invested in building the sales organization 18 to 24 months prior. So, so the whole experience was, was amazing. You know, you hear a lot about the IPO roadshow being draining and exhausting, and, and, and it is because you're packing 10, 12 meetings into every day, and you're doing that eight, nine, 10 days in a row. But it was extraordinarily exhilarating. It was one of the best experiences of my life. And you get a chance, you know, as a founder, to meet with these very bright uh, technology public equity investors and tell your story and talk about your strategy and your culture and your customers. And it's an absolute joy to do it. And so for us, we went public uh, March 22nd of 2012. We just had a five year anniversary, actually, very similar here at 1871, which is special. And the IPO was extraordinarily well received. We came out north of a, a billion dollar valuation, had a chance to you know, go up on the podium and ring the opening bell, which was a, an out of body experience because you're, you're already kind of exhausted from two weeks of, and hundreds of conversations where you're you know, talking about every facet of your business. And then I got swept down and went live on CNBC with uh, Jim Cramer. So uh, the, yeah, the whole experience was just oh, amazing. Great. How awesome. So um, how'd you decide to sell and why? Yeah, so we were very happy, you know, as an independent public company. We had been public for five quarters, um, you know, had met and exceeded Wall Street's expectations every quarter. We had done two acquisitions. We were about 300 million in revenue heading to 400. So we were a company of real size and scale. We had 2,000 employees, offices all around the world, and it had a very bright future. What, what started to happen was that all the really, really large software companies started realizing that marketing and the marketing cloud was going to be an important component of their future. And we were well positioned because we integrated so tightly into all those CRM platforms. So going all the way back literally to our founding story, our thesis was if we can be the database of record for marketers, we're going to be able to drive the most personalized, relevant digital communications. So we built APIs very early, built productized integrations with all the leading CRM platforms early so that we could really be the database of record for the marketer. So as a result, we had very close relationships with Salesforce, Microsoft, Adobe, SAP, Oracle, all the players. And when they started to sense that the next big kind of wave of cloud growth was going to come from marketing, we were very well positioned. So Salesforce made the first inquiry. What ensued was a, a competitive process. And, and you know, as a public company, you know, your ultimate responsibility is, is really do what's in the best interest of the shareholder. So we, you know, followed, you know, every governance guideline to the T and had excellent legal advisors and, and banking advisors. I had a, a board that had a lot of experience in this area where the independent directors were really guiding the process. And fortunately, it turned out to be a great outcome. You know, as we, as we went through the process, and certainly very bittersweet, you know, selling your business for, you know, any of the entrepreneurs who have gone through this, there's a lot of joy and jubilation, but there's also, you know, some sorrow and bittersweetness that comes along with it. You know, I had hoped for two things. One, that we'd end up with just an amazing company that would continue to grow and invest in our customers and our employees and also Indianapolis. That, that was important to me. And two, I was hopeful that the premium they were willing to pay on what we had been publicly traded for was, was such a premium that it would become kind of a financial no-brainer for our shareholders. And unfortunately, that's what happened. Salesforce and the other bidders were amazing companies and would have been a great home for exact target. We were trading kind of in the, in the low 20s and the exit price was 33.75, so it was wow. a very substantial premium where any investor who ever invested in exact target from friends and family to venture rounds to every public investor 
was in the money, and that, that was important to me. I thought to put a huge win in the book where every shareholder, literally every investor and shareholder made money on the investment, made me very happy. And then Salesforce is such a remarkable company. I had a lot of confidence that Mark and the Salesforce team would keep investing in Indy and would be uh, an amazing environment for our employees to continue to build their careers. So, so talk about what was that experience? How was it like, how long were you at Salesforce and what was that experience? Yeah, so like? I, I stayed, at, uh, working at Salesforce was incredible. So I, I felt like I learned an immeasurable amount at Exact Target and then probably got my PhD in SAS, you know, working for, for Mark Benioff. I, I stayed for about 15 months and he was wonderful to me and, and to the company. So I had an opportunity not only to run Exact Target but also run the Salesforce marketing cloud in, in its entirety, which included two acquisitions they had done earlier, Buddy Media and Radiant 6 in the social space. And, and that worked out so well for us because Salesforce had made a big move into social marketing, but their customers were really saying, we want more and we want a multi-channel platform and we want a marketing database of record. And the needs that customers were expressing to Salesforce were an amazing fit with the platform and the company that we had built. So it really was a great marriage. But I, I had a chance to be a part of uh, you know, Mark's executive team for 15 months, run the marketing cloud, lead the integration. So it was, it was, it was, it was an incredible learning experience for me. That's great. Well, it's, uh, we've had a couple of our friends, Godard Abel, who's a Chicago founder yeah, guest. Yeah, Godard's done amazingly well. Um, and, uh, and so there, we'll see what he does next, of I actually saw Godard last week. So uh, he's, he's, he's doing great and also learning a lot. And that's, that's really the, one of the really fun elements is you learn so much going through your own journey and then living within the four walls of Salesforce when we had admired them and in many ways kind of replicated their business model over the years to get a chance to accelerate my learning and the learning of everybody else in the company by kind of learning from the best was, was just incredible. We took a new appreciation for speed, urgency, innovation, marketing, casting a big vision. You know, there's a lot to learn there. Good. So uh, going to the questions from the audience here, what's your number one vote getter? What's your greatest challenge starting a new company? I think talent. Yeah, you know, I think so much of early stage companies is finding the right talent that can work well as a team, have domain experience, and probably most importantly, have the grit and the fire to go solve a big problem in the world and know that it's gonna be really hard. You know, all of you know, company building is remarkably difficult and you have to have just tremendous grit and resilience to do it and to see it all the way through. So we look for the right co-founders and leadership team that we can build that have got the grit and the hunger, but also have the industry expertise that's really gonna help them. Got it. Um, the, um, I'm not, I'm gonna, some of these aren't appropriate for uh, the taping, so I appreciate <laughs> it. But we'll get to those later. The, the um, who has been your best mentor and what valuable advice did they give you? I'd say I've had so many. Honestly, it's hard for me to identify just one. And I think maybe this is a, maybe kind of a word of advice for, for entrepreneurs in the group as well, is that I think it's good to have a go-to mentor that maybe has traveled the road you're gonna be traveling. And for me, that was Bob Compton, who I referenced. He, he was just an amazing chairman and mentor for me for seven or eight years and helped me learn and grow in a really significant way. But then I found as I built my board and set of advisors later stage, and many of those came from the venture firms that we attracted into Exact Target, that I went to each of them for very different reasons. So they all became kind of mentors to me in maybe different, in different ways, different aspects of my life or different areas of the business. So I might have one board member who was brilliant from a product vision perspective and could really help guide me in how to run a product and technology company without a technical background. Had another board member who had an extraordinary amount of experience around governance and leading audit committees and what life as a public company would look like. And he really became my kind of moral, moral and ethical compass and, and really readied me for what it took to be a, a public company CEO. Um, I had a, a, another board member who was just brilliant on the go-to-marketing side and helped us build all of our economic models around how to scale a sales organization. So it became a lot of mentor relationships that all helped me in different ways. And I think that's one of the keys actually is you build your investor roster and build your board roster is to find advisors that are different and unique and very complementary to one another and can help you in really different ways. Got it, good. Um, we don't have much of a voting crowd tonight, so normally I say 10 or more. I don't have any that have 10 or more, so okay. it's a wide breadth of questions, but not a lot of um, 
uh, uh, votes for any of them. So if you have any you're really excited to hear, please vote for them. But when they're kind of three or four, it's hard to cover all of those. A um, Couple questions we always ask our founders that um, always end up being very popular online uh, is if you were to, to be a founder again, is there something you would never do again? Like a mistake you've made or almost made or uh, made and corrected that you say, boy, definitely do, do something different the next time. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Things that worked out so well for us the first time that uh, you know, I've, I've got to, I've got to, yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to do it that much differently. But I think second time now that I'm older, wiser, more experienced, I would, I would be in position I think where I could build a more experienced leadership team early. I could also probably capitalize the business in a different way. But I'd be careful not to overcapitalize it because I think you can make a lot of mistakes if you are too comfortable and you have too much money to invest in the business. So I'd say that would be one of my challenges, would make sure that I capitalize the business enough for us to build an amazing product and build some organizational scale and probably serve large enterprises, but not capitalize it too much that you lose the edge and the grit that comes from being capital efficient. And, and, so at and, what stage would you take an outside investor then to, to do that? I think I would take an outside investor when the company was ready to scale and I felt like outside counsel could really help us. And actually, High Alpha is a good, a good example. So going back to the High Alpha studio, we raised outside capital for the High Alpha studio. And our lead investor is Emergence Capital out of San Francisco. And then Hyde Park. Uh, Hyde Park is also an investor, uh, Tim Kopp and Ira and Guy. And we felt that both of those investors were important to us. Hyde Park helped us from a Midwest coverage perspective. And also, Tim Kopp was my former CMO at Exact Target. We have a real deep history together. And then Emergence was really important. Gordon Ritter, the partner at Emergence, is, is on our board. And we felt it was important to get the West Coast perspective yeah. into, into High Alpha and into the new companies we're starting. Because we have a playbook we like to run around B2B SaaS. We're very loyal to Indy and, and Midwest tech in general. I, I'm the biggest champion of Midwest entrepreneurship that you're fine, but I really felt that getting the West Coast perspective and West Coast connectivity and a challenge from West Coast thinkers was going to be important. And that's just some stereotypes and generalizations in that statement. But I did think it was important that we didn't get too insular into what we were building. So, so there's a real life example where we perhaps didn't need to seek outside investors, but we did because we thought they could add a lot of value to what we were building. We'll talk a little bit more as we, before we wrap up here about High Alpha. And you have a studio. A lot of people may not know what a studio, uh, startup studio is. And then you have the fun first. What's the, what is your studio and how does a studio work and then why the fund and how, what's the role of the fund with and separate from the? Yeah, thank you. So we, we think we're pioneering a really unique model. It's certainly a model that's really appropriate for Indianapolis and I think for Midwest cities in general where we're, we're pairing together company formation and startup studio with venture capital and doing it in a really unique way. So we're focused on next generation enterprise cloud companies. So we're focused on those B2B SaaS companies that we know so well. But we're one part company starter and company builder, and that's fascinating. We have 20 of us on staff, designers, developers, business analysts, SaaS subject matter experts, where we are always searching for new ideas. We're nurturing our own ideas. We have entrepreneurs approach us with an idea where they- Do you have classes or cohorts, or how does it work? How many, we, how many are in the studio at a time? We've started nine over two years. We actually, we actually kind of grandfathered equity we had in companies we'd started prior in three, and then we've started six net new companies over two years. And they're always started by your team. They are, they are. It, it could be an entrepreneur that approaches us with an idea that they want to partner on and want help in kind of launching and growing the business. Could be our own idea, or we also do joint ventures. So we work a lot with corporate innovation groups looking for you know, where they see opportunity or where there might be a disruptive opportunity in a given industry. And we do joint ventures and start companies together as well. So we, we like to think of the top of the funnel as being very, very wide. We take ideas from everywhere. And then our big forcing function is what we call Sprint Week, where three times a year we run what we call Sprint Week, where we break into teams. We have four founders of High Alpha, and each of us lead a team. We're also highly competitive. We break into teams of six or seven. We bring in outside experts, and we just go, we go all in on the idea for the week. So we'll do market research, market analysis, customer validation. We design the MVP. We build financial models. We do everything we can to build conviction around the winning business idea. And then it's essentially an internal pitch competition at the end of the week where we pitch our 
four ideas we'd worked on all week, and then the next day we huddle and we decide which new business to start. And when we start a business, it's a commitment. We're, have all the nines come through those? They have, they have, yeah. The, the three we started with, but the six new have come through that process. And it's, it's a beautiful forcing function, and I'm sure many of you entrepreneurs can relate to this, but you can always find a reason not to start a business. It's too competitive, difficult to raise capital, hard to find those early customers, it's a crowded space. And Sprint Week actually forces us to start two to three businesses a year and make sure we're really green lighting the one that we have the most conviction around. So it, it's worked really well for us. And then we become matchmaker. We, we take big idea, we recruit co-founders, we provide that startup capital, and then what, away we how go. How much capital do you normally put We in? put a half a million in, and then you know, a million or two of services, because we'll run payroll benefits, we co-locate, we do a lot of design work, we're the interim CFO and, and head of HR and talent. So we, we try to take kind of all the noise away from the entrepreneur and just allow them to focus on building an amazing product, build a great team, and find early customers. And then six to nine months in is when we raise a seed round and they start to build some of those functions into their own business. But what's interesting is we're not an accelerator in the sense that you go through a program for a period of time and then good luck. We're attached to the hip forever. You know, our stock is founding common stock. We continue to serve on the board. We want to be supporting the CEO, not driving key decisions, you know, as the company gets its own identity and gets more momentum, but we're, we're always there to be a resource. Which of them have made it furthest along, gone furthest, fastest? Yeah, good question. We have, I'd say one at about 10 million in ARR, wow. one at about three or four, a couple at about a million, and then a lot that are still early stage. So they're all, they're all young and all just getting started. And how do you see that model evolving? You feel like you've gotten it to the point where you've kind of cracked the code, or do you see it evolving as and grow or scaling as time goes on? I th we're still, I think we're learning, you know, and evolving and, and, and identifying new patterns and trying new approaches. And this market's so fast and dynamic and fluid yeah. that we're, we're always you're kind of making adjustments. And, and really, we're trying to reduce risk for the entrepreneur, increase the probability of success, and we're also trying to go faster. We're trying to reduce cycle time, and our hope is that we can, we can create fast-growing breakout SaaS companies faster than an entrepreneur would be able to do on their own. The other piece of the puzzle, also interesting enough, is we have High Alpha Capital, which is our venture fund that can invest in our companies when they're ready for a seed round, and that is very meaningful, especially in a, a market like Indianapolis that doesn't have a lot of uh, venture capital. Same partners? Um, same partners. Who are, the, who are your partners in Yeah, so a guy named Mike Fitzgerald, who ran corporate development for me at Exact Target. Uh, Eric Tobias, three-time entrepreneur, ran a company called iGo Digital that we acquired at, at ET in 2012. And then Christian Anderson, a uh, very successful uh, entrepreneur who's been very active in kind of angel investing, and, uh, but also has run a very successful digital and web agency and has a lot of experience in starting and scaling SaaS companies. So, so Eric is kind of the product and tech guy. Mike is kind of you know corporate strategy. Christian is brand and design, and then you know I work on a lot of the financing and and CEO recruiting how, how and those kind of the, functions. How big is the fund? So we have a twenty one million dollar fund on the high alpha capital side. Got it. And do you always invest in the studio companies then? We do. Got it. So we commit that we'll invest in the studio company with about two thirds of our capital, and then one third of our capital is just up and out investing in the best entrepreneurs and highest growth SaaS companies that we attach to. So the most important question to a Chicagoan tonight is, how do we connect what you're doing more closely to our ecosystem? We'd love to. We'd love to. Actually, interesting enough, our first investment was G2 Crowd. Really? Yeah. So that's kind of a, that's kind yeah, of a fun we're story. We're at Chicago Ventures. That's a great. But I'm a Godard Abel's company. But I'm I'm a huge advocate for indie tech, Chicago tech, and and just Midwestern entrepreneurship on the whole. And I think it is remarkably important that we find ways to partner and collaborate. Like together, we're stronger mm -hmm. than we ever would be independently. So Absolutely. we're doing a lot of work to make those connections here in Chicago, but also in markets like Columbus and Cincinnati and Ann Arbor. And I think it's really important that we have a really tight affiliation from Midwestern city to Midwestern city to build great companies. Absolutely. Well, we're lucky to have you as a part of ours. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. My pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks.